Okay, good afternoon. I, whilst we're just uh, waiting on people to arrive with their virtual, um, into their virtual rooms, I will make a very slow start to uh, uh, welcoming Jeroen. So uh, welcome again to the DEI um, twice monthly lecture seminar series. Uh, it's lovely to have uh, so many people join us yet again. Of course, we've reverted back to um, a virtual. Uh, we will in future be running uh, hybrid uh, conversations, uh, bringing together both mm. some face-to-face -face and those further afield that can join us online. Uh, as is the case um, previously, what I would ask you to do is uh, keep your microphone muted. It's up to you whether or not your video shows. And if you have and when you have questions, to pop those into the chat. Uh, I'll do my best to keep an eye on those. Uh, and uh, once we get to the end of the talk, uh, then uh, I'll either invite you to ask those questions if you've got a microphone, or I can ask them on your behalf. Um, okay, so today uh, we're going to hear from a good friend and very good colleague of mine, Jeroen van Hoenen. Uh, Jeroen is a, a geoscientist uh, who spent a chunk of his career here in Durham. When we first met back in 2009 uh, and uh, uh, our first conversation, I understood that Jeroen's research interests were all around the way in which large slabs of the Earth's crust get subducted, you know, pass beneath one, pass beneath another. Uh, and the modeling work he was doing in terms of understanding those processes and the heat transfer. I'm not quite sure what happened, but I think there was a bit of an epiphany a few years ago, uh, whilst Jeroen still working at uh, extensively on that kind of very large scale geology, he started to take a, an interest in work which was being done uh, by Charlotte Adams on the potential value of old flooded abandoned coal mines uh, to produce heat. And uh, Urine asked the question, uh, how sustainable is that heat? How easily is the heat transferred from the rock into the fluid? And how does the geometry of the old mine workings influence uh, the way in which you might uh, develop that resource. And that's what you're going to hear today. So, uh, great pleasure, Jeroen, in welcoming you to present a DEI seminar. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, John. Can we, everybody see this screen? Okay. <clears throat> okay, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present this work. Um, so as John said, yes, my, my uh, background is in, well, basically modeling fluid dynamics on, on, on a different scales, but not really in mine water heating. And uh, what actually happened was that um, several years ago, um, uh, Charlotte Adams, who was still at the, in our department, organized a departmental seminar uh, in, in earth sciences that was given by Alison Monaghan from the, from the British Geological Survey. Uh, that was a fascinating talk, and um, that's essentially how I got interested in, in this topic and uh, afterwards talking a lot to Charlotte and, and John and so on. So the plan for this talk is uh, four parts. I would first like to give a, a brief introduction to, to my water heating. Um, then I'll talk about a, a project that uh, recently got funded, uh, which is the, the GEMS project. Then I'll talk a little bit more about how we can use numerical modeling to uh, give some insight into mine water heating. And uh, finally, we'll, we'll, uh, I would like to uh, show one application of this work, which is uh, using mine water heating, perhaps at Durham University. So before I forget, I would like to thank a number of people. First of all, this GEMS project, which I will talk about later, has a, a large number of people involved. I would like to thank everyone involved in that. Um, because it really stimulated discussions and so on, and, and therefore what I'm, what I'm showing today. I would also like to thank Michael McKenzie. Uh, he, uh, has, uh, he is almost finished with a master's project, 
uh, and I'm going to show quite a number of uh, slides from basically from his work. I'd also like to thank Charlotte Adams and John for very fruitful discussions and Sam Graham for some uh, uh, model uh, work. Okay, so um, let me start with a principal mechanism and the rationale for using mine water heating. So the earth interior is very hot, as we probably all know. It's about six to six and a half to seven thousand degrees at the, at the center, and then it increases, it, it decreases to towards the surface. And that heat is constantly spilling out into, into space. Um, every second, about 44 terajoules are being released into, into, uh, into space, into the atmosphere. So to put that into context, that's roughly similar to uh, 100,000 nuclear plants or so, or 60 milliwatts for every square meter of the Earth's surface. Now, 50% of that heat is immediately being replenished by radioactive decay. Uh, processes inside the earth and the other 50% leads to very, very slow cooling of the earth. But the, the, the bottom line is that um, heat coming out of the earth is, is, um, is very long term and uh, provides us with an enormous heat source that we can make use of. In the UK, uh, this, this uh, releasing of heat leads to a thermal gradient of 30 kilometers, 30 degrees per kilometer. So uh, for every kilometer you go, further down into the earth, the temperature increases by 30 degrees. And this is something you can actually immediately observe when you measure the temperatures in the various coal mines uh, in the UK or other mines. You, you, you'd notice that the temperature increases roughly by 30 degrees for every kilometer. Um, so uh, to uh, give a few more numbers to, to set the scene for mine water heating, there are about 23, thousand individual mines in the UK. So it's an awful lot of mines. Uh, almost all of those mines are coal mines. They're, they're not used anymore. And because they're not used, uh, they stopped the, the, the water pumping process as well. So almost all those mines are now flooded. Uh, the mines are located uh, as shown on this, this map here on the right. So a lot of the mines here in the Northeast um, uh, but there's also quite a number of mines in, in the Midlands, in South uh, Scotland uh, and South Wales. Now, roughly one in four homes uh, in the UK is built right on top of one of those mines. So that's, that's actually quite a large number uh, and offers the opportunity for actually using mine heat to warm those homes. Now, the, the mine water itself is, is only somewhere between 12 and 25 degrees, depending on the depth of the mine. Uh, that's obviously not enough to warm our homes with, but using heat pump technology, we can actually increase this to a more comfortable 40 to 50 degrees. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it in a second. Uh, finally, if you would take all the water that sits in all of those mines together and extract the heat from it, uh, um, then that heat would be enough to warm our homes, or at least all the homes right on top of it for at least the next hundred years or so. So we're talking about a really large um, uh, resource here. Okay, so how does, how does it work? Well, this, this uh, schematic diagram illustrates, illustrates it. Uh, you, you'd extract water from uh, uh, some mine workings. That water is then transported towards a, a heat pump. The heat pump takes the heat out of the mine water and the mine water itself is re-injected back into the mines in a, in a so-called open loop system. And the extracted heat is then being injected into another closed loop water system uh, where the water is then, the water temperature is increased to 40 or 50 degrees Celsius and uh, transported to homes so we can use it to, to warm our homes with. Um, so the magic seems to happen in, in these heat pumps over here. So how does a heat pump work? Um, well, the short answer is uh, your fridge is essentially uh, a form of a heat pump. Uh, but maybe the, the slightly more useful answer is that um, the heat pump essentially, the central part of a heat pump is essentially a closed loop system, a closed loop uh, container through which a, a, a fluid, a refrigerant is being pumped around. Uh, using using a pump. Now, uh, on the other end, uh, you've got a, a valve that actually re reduces the flow 
of, of, of fluid flowing around. And there's two containers. There's the evaporator container and the condenser container. Uh, because of this pump, this pump is constantly pumping uh, fluid out of, of the left container into the right container. So the pressure in the left container is always low and the pressure in the right container is high. And this low pressure on the left leads to constant evaporation of this refrigerant, so from a liquid to a gas phase, and that um, the evaporation requires heat, and that heat is then being extracted from, from the surrounding. And the surrounding in this case is the mine water that's being wrapped around that, that container. So the mine water is being cooled by the evaporation of the refrigerant. That refrigerant is then forced into this condenser container where the pressure is really high, and there the opposite is happening. The high pressures force the, the, the gas refrigerant to condense into a liquid. And by doing so, that releases a lot of latent heat. That latent heat is then absorbed by the surrounding, in this case, another closed loop water system. And that water is then warmed up, transported to, to our homes where we, where we can use it uh, to warm, to warm uh, uh, our houses. So to compare this to a, a refrigerator, essentially it, it works in the same way, except for that the left part here is the inside of our fridge and the right hand side part is the back of the fridge where we have this, this uh, radiator that constantly releases heat into our kitchen. Now, this system works best if the temperatures of the mine water aren't very low and the water temperatures of the outgoing water isn't very high. So the water temperature is going out, as, as I said before, 40 to 50 degrees. And in that case, we have a so-called coefficient of performance, um, COP, uh, um, of around 3.9. So that means that every kilowatt that we have to put into this compressor, into this pump, um, releases, uh, so that's the input of energy we have to put in from the grid, uh, that is going to create 3.9 kilowatts of energy uh, in terms of heat. So that sounds like a good deal. But of course, if we want higher temperatures or we have really low water temperatures, then the coefficient of performance drops to, to something lower. Um, okay, well, uh, mine water heating is relatively new in the UK, but even, even around the world, it's not widely used everywhere. So. Uh, it's, it's still a fairly novel technique, but it's, um, it's, it's not completely new in the sense that already back in the 1980s, it was used. And this is an example of one of the first, occasion, first locations where it's been used, uh, a, a little town called Spring Hill in Nova Scotia, um, in Canada, where already since the 1980s, they're using mine water to warm their local premises, uh, local businesses mostly, but also a few private homes. Um, in Europe, we have several success stories as well, including in Spain and in Poland, and probably the, the best known uh, example of European mine water heating is in Heerlen in the Netherlands. Uh, so in the south of the Netherlands, the situation is actually fairly comparable to, to the northeast of, of England in the sense that there's lots of coal mining and a coal mining industry, former coal mining industry that, that stopped um, several decades ago. They've already used mine water since the early 2000s, but in 2008, they upgraded their system to what they now call mine water 2.0. And uh, they're using this to, to heat and cool uh, a, a total uh, surface area of around 40,000 square meters, divided over several different buildings. And uh, they use two separate mine workings, one at 700 meters and one at 250 meters depth. And uh, they, the way it works is that in the winter, they, when they need the heat, they pump the heat out of the deeper mine system, 700 meters, use, it, use the warm water to, uh, to warm the, the, the local uh, buildings, and then pump the colder result, uh, resultant water into the shallower uh, seam. And in the summer, they do the reverse. They take the shallow water out, which is cold. Uh, they use it to, to cool down the buildings as a, as a kind of form of air conditioning and uh, um, warm that mine water with it and then put that warmer mine water back into the deeper sea. Closer to home, we have um, uh, an excellent example um, 
very nearby, uh, which is the Lanchester Wines Warehouses. So this is a, a company that imports wines and they have to keep those wines at a, at a fairly constant temperature. And for that, they have two warehouses, which are actually located in, in Gateshead, uh, uh, not in, uh, in Lanchester. And each of those two warehouses has their own uh, mine water heating system installed. And after a few initial teething problems, they, this is now a, a very well working system uh, and, and probably one of the best examples of how we can use mine water heat in, in the UK. Um, nearby in the, the center of Gateshead, they are planning to build uh, a, a larger system uh, mine water system that um, is supposed to, to be um, warming around 1250 private homes. And it, this, this development is in a, in a fairly advanced stage. They've already uh, drilled the, the boreholes, they have done the testing. So this is going to be operational fairly soon. Uh, a bit further south, we have a, another project that's in the making, which is uh, uh, an entirely new village called Seam Garden Village, which is, as, as, as you can see from the word, it's, it's, it's located very close to Seam. And in Seam, um, they have the Dalden mine water treatment plant. So the, the way they're going to use mine water to heat the, the, the village of Seam Garden Village um, is going to be slightly different from, from the previous examples in the sense that they're already pumping water up. The reason why they're doing this is not to use the heat, but to actually protect an overlying aquifer from which about 200,000 people get their drinking water from. So if they wouldn't do the pumping, then the, the, there is a risk that the, the mine water, which is, which is quite uh, polluting, would, would enter the aquifer and we couldn't use the, the, that anymore for drinking water. So um, if this is up, once this is up and running, this is supposed to provide uh, the heat to about 1,500 homes and a school and shops and other uh, premises. Uh, and this probably would then be uh, one of the first district heating schemes that would use mine water heating. So there's lots of uh, uh, an increasing amount of, of, uh, of interest in mine water heating. And there's also an increasing amount of funding available uh, to look into uh, using mine water heating. And um, about two years ago, uh, early 2020s, uh, a group of us from the Durham Energy Institute um, uh, were trying to go uh, and get some funding from uh, uh, a funding call that was combined from uh, EPSERC and NERC, uh, which was called De uh, Decarbonizing Heating and Cooling. So we applied for the funding uh, with a group of PIs listed over here, and uh, we were successful. And now we have a a project called GEMS, and GEMS stands for Geothermal Energy from Mines and Solar Geothermal Heat. It's going to run for the next three years uh, uh, and with a total uh, uh, funding of about 1.7 million pounds. Uh, and this is uh, going to fund four PDRAs working on various different topics. It's a, it's a combined uh, project between Durham University and uh, the British Geological Survey, and there's also a number of essential project partners, and they're listed over here, including Lanchester Wines and the the, the Mainwater Bewe in Heerlen in the Netherlands, uh, and, and a number of other uh, uh, project partners that are going to provide valuable information, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so, in the GEMS project, we have a number of key uh, uh, aims or objectives that we want to reach uh, through over the next three years. And, and each one of those is essentially dealing with a, one of the major challenges that we have in uh, rolling out this mine water heating system on a, on a much larger scale. First of all, is that we want to get a good understanding of how to efficiently get the heat out of the ground. And that's essentially one of the work packages that we're going to work on. And this is mostly done from the Earth Science Department. Um, increasingly, we, we need um, to look not only at extraction of heat somehow, so the creation of heat, but also the storage of heat. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. And because uh, uh, mine water is a fairly new uh, uh, concept in the UK, 
uh, there's a lot of regulations and policies that are not really fit for purpose anymore. So we would like to make some recommendations there as well. And finally, we want to look at the practical implications all of this would have for the end user, the, the person who is going to heat their homes using mine water heating. So that's basically in a, in a nutshell what the, the GEMS project is, uh, is planning to work on over the next three years. Um, so let me elaborate a little bit more on each of those in each of those topics. So first of all, uh, heat extraction. Why do we want to look into this a little bit more? Well, as I explained before, we we, we are using a so-called closed, uh, sorry, open loop system. So we have uh, water extracted from the mines, but we also return it back to the mines. And the reason for that is that the water is 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 quite polluting. It has lots of heavy metals and so on in it. And you can't just discharge it easily as surface water. Instead, what we would like to do is to uh, inject that water back into the mines. But there's a, a, a significant risk that if you do so, that the cold water that you inject then ends up at the abstraction point again. Uh, and with the result that you're pumping up cold water and then your, your heating system is essentially broken. So um, in order to avoid that, we, we need to have a proper understanding of how that how the mine system works and how the water is flowing through and warming up as it as, as it does so. And for that, uh, we developed a numerical modeling tool, and I'll talk about it later on in the talk, to kind of investigate um, using using a model how that water would be warming up and, and be uh, uh, going through the mine system. Now. Uh, such a modeling tool would only be as good as the parameters you put into. And there's a lot of information that needs to go into these models. And, and for that, we are uh, heavily relying on, on our project partners. So first of all, we need accurate mine plans. We need to understand where the water is going and, and how it's going to be distributed. And for that, we work closely with the core authority who actually owns all the mine plans in the UK and has, has significant knowledge about those about them as well. The problem with the mine plans is that they some of them are really old and they are not all that all of them are very accurate for for several obvious reasons. Some of the mines might have collapsed since they closed uh, or have been backfilled, so rubble being put back in when the mines were closed. So, um, so in order to understand the mines better, uh, we in, in addition, we would like to also work with the people who have really good local knowledge about those mines. So essentially the ex-mining community. And uh, we already had very fruitful discussions with, for example, the, uh, the North of England Mining Institute who, who provided us with, with very valuable information about mine plans. The other thing we need to do is once we have a model up and running, we need to calibrate it. We need to test if it's actually working. Uh, and we want to do that with a, a physical uh, uh, model. Um, so in other words, a real mine where we're going to inject real water and measure the real temperatures. Um, luckily for us, uh, uh, the so-called Glasgow Geoenergy Observatory is almost ready to be to be used. It's, it's a system that's essentially uh, 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 a laboratory being set up under the under Glasgow, using the mines there. Uh, boreholes have already been drilled. Lots of monitoring equipment is sitting in it, and so we can do physical experiments there and measure lots of things. And that's what we're planning to do, probably starting this summer. And this is part of the of the Gems project as well. But we also can use data from. Uh, from projects that are already up and running. So for example, Lanchester Wines and, and, and uh, the project in Heerlen. So we're closely working with those project partners as well. So that's about uh, 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 trying to get better information about um, extracting the heat. But there's actually, as I said before, there's also a real uh, need to store the heat. And, and one of the reasons is uh, because this, this uh, new energy uh, heat energy source, maybe not as flexible as the old one. And what I mean by that is that um, uh, we, we typically only need heat in the winter. And even in the winter, we only usually need it during the day, not at night. Now, for the conventional heating system, so essentially our gas boiler, uh, that's easy. You just switch them on or off. But for a lot of other heat sources, that's not so easily done, particularly not if you're, if you're dealing with uh, district heating schemes. So in other words, 
a better solution might be to to have the heat stored somewhere so that you can use it when you actually need it um, and uh, we want to look at two different types of storage heat storage one is to actually use the mines as heat storage uh, facilities so just pump heat down when we create it and then later on get it back out when we want to when we want to use it the other one um uh, I'm sorry, and for that we would again do physical experiments using the Glasgow Geo Observatory uh, and perhaps do some modeling as well. The other part is actually uh, looking at uh, clever uh, engineering solutions uh, and the uh, engineering department is, is, is going to, uh, to do some research on that over the next three years in the, in the DAMS project. Essentially, the, the kind of things they want to look at is to use sorption techniques, so physical or chemical sorption techniques, to, to look at how you can store heat in a very compact way by looking at sorption reactions to, to, to store heat um, and release it again for, uh, during these reactions. Um, as I said before, the end user, uh, we need to be concerned about that as well. Uh, because uh, whatever, uh, however we're going to introduce this new um, heating scheme, it's going to lead to some disruption for the end user. Uh, first of all, gas boilers are sooner or later going to be banned in the UK, uh, and we're going to phase them out and replace them with something else. Well, that something else, as I explained before, um, uh, might be, uh, if, if, if that would be a, a, a heat pump, then that's probably going to give us lower temperatures than the typical temperatures that run through our radiator today, which is more like 70 to 80 degrees as com in compared to the 40 or 50 degrees that heat pumps typically provide. So our standard radiator might not be so suitable anymore for, for, for heat pumps, any type of heat pump. So that also includes air source or ground source heat pumps. So in other words, we need maybe another type of heating in our homes, maybe something like uh, underfloor heating. Uh, so uh, we're, we're probably talking about significant retrofitting somehow. The other thing is uh, the costs that are involved in all of this. Um, is this going to be uh, directly uh, charged to the end user? Uh, because we have significant capital costs that, that a, a single end user would never be able to pay for. We have, we've got things like drilling boreholes and uh, installing a water pump and installing a heat pump and then all kind of uh, administrative costs. And this could easily add up to something like 400,000 pounds for, for an individual system. Now, typically those capital costs are, are normal when, when you start to, to use a new system, but um, you, you'd, you'd hope that the running costs, so the long-term costs, uh, would, would kind of make up for it because the new energy source would be cheaper than the old one. The question is if that's really the case for mine water heating. And to, uh, a, a simple way of looking at it is, uh, as I explained before, you would think that mine water heating is cheaper than gas heating because we only need to put one kilowatt of energy into it to get almost four kilowatts out, 3.9. Um, but the, the, the problem here is that that one kilowatt that we put into the system to get 3.9 out is electrical energy and electricity is more expensive than gas. So, uh, in fact, it's significantly more expensive. Uh, and, and throughout uh, 2021, electricity was around four and a half times more expensive than gas. So that kind of, uh, well, that takes away the advantage of, of, of uh, using a heat pump then. And then uh, you could argue that maybe mine water heating is, is not very cost effective. Probably is true, it is not very cost effective at the moment, but this plot over here shows how that ratio of electricity to gas is rapidly uh, decreasing over time. And, and this, this uh, with, with increasing gas prices, as we're, we're, we're experiencing today, uh, and recently, this is only likely to continue. And in other words, the, the running costs are probably going to be lower for uh, mine water heating than, than gas in the near future. Uh, and then of course, we've got environmental costs as well uh, that at the moment are not taken into account, but uh, clearly we have um, the environmental cost of using fossil fuels, uh, which could be significantly re reduced if, uh, if we uh, would be using systems like mine water heating. 
the, the, the key thing is that this disruption and these costs, um, we want to make sure that we work together with the end users to make sure that this transition happens as smoothly as possible. Uh, so rather than imposing these systems onto the end user, we'd like to work with the end user to find the best solutions. And that relates to another part, oh, by the way, sorry, this, this, these are the kind of things that are probably going to be investigated um, in, the, um, uh, in the anthropology uh, department. Another aspect that is uh, probably going to be investigated in anthropology, but also at the, um, the um, business school, is looking into regulations and policies. As I said, mine water heating is fairly new and a lot of regulations are not really fit for purpose. Just to give you an example, um, the, the, the heat uh, that sits in the ground below 300 meters depth is not owned by anyone. Um, so this is kind of surprising because a lot of mines are actually located below 300 meters. And that means that nobody really owns the heat in there. Well, this is clearly uh, something we need, to, we need to look into when we're going to use heat for commercial purposes. Another thing is that, um, as I mentioned before, there's lots of significant upfront costs, significant capital costs uh, to deal with. And therefore we need investors to, uh, to help us cover those up those capital costs but there are also significant risks involved in mine water heating just as an example uh, the, the the borehole drilling uh, isn't always successful and it, there is a there is a chance that actually the boreholes don't actually uh, drill into the mine workings and clearly uh, that would be a significant financial risk to take and with these risks it's probably hard to find investors so probably government finance schemes are necessary here and finally this is probably an opportunity to make sure that the energy transition to renewable clean energy is done in a socially just way um, many of the mines uh, um, sorry uh, many of the communities that that, um, that build those mines in the first place are also uh, some of the most deprived areas in, in the uk and we have a real opportunity to make sure that those communities uh, benefit most from this new energy source in terms of providing hopefully cheap energy, but also providing um, uh, job opportunities that go with it. So these are the kind of things that uh, the GEMS project hopes to, uh, to, to look into. So uh, the remaining part of this talk, I would like to, to talk specifically on, on, uh, on one aspect of, of uh, mine water heating, and that is looking into the extraction of heat from the ground, which is <clears throat> uh, probably where my own expertise comes in uh, uh, most. And um, to do that, we, we set up a numerical uh, model, modeling uh, tool to, to investigate this. So the way we set this up is, is, um, is as follows. If you look at the typical mine plan, such as shown here on the top right in the, in the slide, you, you notice that um, uh, this typical mine system has the so-called pillar and room uh, mining uh, approach. So there's lots of little roadways, little rooms as they're called, uh, and, they're, and they're separated by pillars. So these are little blocks of, of coal which have not been mined at all. Uh, the reason that these pillars have not been mined is that otherwise the entire mine would collapse, which would lead to something called long wall mining, which is also applied. Uh, but a lot of the mines have these so-called room and pillar uh, uh, system, and uh, this is what we focused on for the modeling. So the way uh, the modeling was set up is to, to assume that each of those roadways is a little um, pipe uh, that could be modeled as a, as a pipe. And then uh, all of these pipe segments together form a pipe network. So in other words, we, we simulate the complex nature of an entire mine with a much simpler pipe network. And then once we have a pipe network set up, uh, and this is kind of a, a simple example here at the bottom, bottom right, uh, we can then investigate how mine water would warm up if you would abstract it at one point and inject it at another point. So if you inject it at let's say the bottom here, then the water is going to flow through the mine system to the abstraction point. And the question is, does it warm up sufficiently as you do so? And this is one of the things we might be able to investigate using, using a numerical modeling tool. Um, 
so the way the, the model is set up is that it first calculates the flow field. And once the flow field is established, then we can calculate the heat exchange between the flowing mine water and the surrounding rocks. Um, and a, a prototype of this code was is, is, is now basically being used, uh, uh, and we use MATLAB to, to write this in. So uh, uh, two additional slides to kind of illustrate how this is calculated. So you can calculate how water flows through a pipe segment if you know the, the, there's a, a pressure gradient on either end of the pipe. So if you know that the, the water pressure on one end of the pipe is slightly higher than on the other end, then obviously the water is going to flow from the high pressure to the lower pressure. But how fast it's going to flow depends on the properties of the, of the pipe. So for example, the diameter of the pipe is going to be important, but also uh, the, 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 the roughness of the walls of the pipe, which is obviously going to be an important issue uh, for mines. So once we have all those properties, we can work out how fast water is going to flow through one individual pipe segment, and then we can link them all together. So then uh, we use uh, the concept of conservation of mass or conservation of water, if you like here, in the sense that um, if you assume uh, water pressures at every single node between pipe segments, then you can calculate how much water is flowing into a node and how much water is flowing out of a node. And in a physical system, those two must equal. The amount of water flowing in must be the same as the water, amount of water flowing out. If they're not the same, that means uh, there's something wrong with the pressure, uh, the pressures at these nodes. So we can adjust them, recalculate it until we find the right solution. So this is an iterative process that we solve using a, a matrix vector system. So once we have the flow being established, then we can calculate the heat transfer. And that's done uh, in a quick semi-analytical way. So we assume that um, if we know the flow through the pipe system, then we can also make an estimate of how much heat is going to be transferred uh, from the uh, rock surrounding the pipe into the water in the pipe. And with that information, we can then calculate how much the temperature will drop in the rock surrounding the wall and how much the temperature in the pipe segment is going to increase. And again, once you know this for one pipe segment, it's very easily uh, um, taken into account for all the pipe segments. You start it at the upstream end, you calculate how much, uh, well, that's usually where, where you inject your new water. You calculate how much the water is warming up until it reaches the next node. From that next node, you can then go on to the next pipe segment and so on and so forth until you reach basically the end of the flow path of every uh, every bit of water which is where it's been abstracted. Uh, so this is in a nutshell how, how such a model would work. And just to illustrate then um, uh, the outcome of, of a model using an extremely simple example, a very uh, uh, synthetic example, suppose we would have a, a very simple mine system with um, water being injected on the left. And then there's two roadways the water can take, the top roadway and the bottom roadway. And then it's been abstracted on the right hand side. Now, <clears throat> uh, the, the two roadways are very similar, except for that the bottom roadway has a narrow part of the pipe. Otherwise, it would be not very interesting. So the, um, the two, because the narrow bit here, the water is going to flow through the top uh, roadway a little bit faster than through the bottom roadway. And uh, this comes out of the flow field. Once we have the flow field established, we can look at the temperature field. And because the water is flowing faster through the top, uh, it means it has less time to warm up. So the water ends up slightly cooler at the abstraction point than the water that flew through the bottom path. Uh, but of course, the two are going to be mixed together and some kind of average temperature is being abstracted at the abstraction borehole. Now, real mine systems obviously don't look like that. They, they are much more complex. And the way we uh, decided to deal with this is use uh, the software ArcGIS, where we import uh, the typical mine plans, which are usually JPEG files. Um, and then we first uh, geo-reference them, so make sure that we have the, the mine uh, plan uh, fixed to, the, to basically the, 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 the surface uh, under which the, the mine plan is sitting. And then we can digitize 
the mine plane. So by 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 designing basically uh, uh, roadways or, or tunnels or or pipes, if you like, uh, and nodes in between the pipes. So just to give you an example, if I go back to this mine plan that I showed you before, which by the way is a is an example of a of part of the mine system that sits right underneath Durham University. Um, so that mine plan um, uh, uh, could be digitized into something that looks something like on here on the right hand side, where we digitize it into a series of, of pipes. Now, um, how can we use such a, uh, uh, such a numerical model? Uh, just to give you a few examples of the kind of calculations you can do with this. So suppose we have this, this mind system. This is all just a very synthetic example. So don't really uh, take the, the numbers that come out here uh, uh, as being directly useful, but just to give you an example of how this works. Suppose we have digitized the mind system and we decide to inject water here at the bottom right and then abstract it somewhere in the middle, an arbitrary point. The, the plot on the left gives you the temperature field the plot on the right gives you the flow field. So you can see uh, the, the, the warm colors show high flow rates. So the flow rates are pretty high uh, at the beginning, but then it spreads out the water and then eventually co all comes together again at the abstraction point. You can see the dark blue areas where the water is not flowing at all. This leads then to warming up. The water is, is injected as cold water. It flows through the mine system. And by the time it reaches the abstraction point, it has warmed up. In this particular example, it has almost reached the, 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 the rock temperatures. Now, if we run exactly the same system, but uh, in this case, we increase the flow rate through the mines. So we, we increased it by a factor of four. By the way, uh, 50 cubic meters per hour uh, was the typical injection rate, which corresponds to roughly 17 uh, liters per second or so. Now we increased this to 200 cubic meters per hour. And then, uh, which is probably not going to be a, a surprise to anyone, uh, because we increase the flow rate, the water is going to flow faster through the mine system, has less time to warm up. And as a consequence, at the abstraction point, the water is going to be significantly colder. Um, a third thing we can look at is to what would be the optimal place to inject the water and abstract it. And this is a, a, like a, an extreme example where we put the injection and abstraction point pretty close together. And as a consequence, the water really only flows between those, those two boreholes and the rest of the mine is, is almost unaffected. So the rest of the mine uh, doesn't have any water flowing through, it stays warm and the water is only being affecting the, the central part of this mine system. And, and as a consequence, doesn't have a, enough time to warm up. And again, the water comes out relatively cold. Final example is uh, what would happen if uh, we would have multiple users using one and the same uh, uh, mine working. Uh, so in this case, we put two injection points and two abstraction points, which then represents two individual users. And you can imagine that if you put these injection and abstraction points at the wrong place, um, they're basically taking away heat from each other. So the, the, the users are gonna feel each other's uh, uh, heat abstraction. So uh, when it comes to regulating heat in mine systems, this might be useful to look into. So these are a few um, synthetic examples, uh, but what I would like to do at the, at the end of, of this talk is to, to talk you through one particular case study. And this is uh, essentially the work that Michael McKenzie uh, has been doing over the last year as part of his uh, MST uh, project. So he, he, he started last year in April, has almost finished and is about to submit his MST thesis on this topic. So the feasibility study that, um, that he was looking into is to see whether the Van Mildred College, one of the colleges of Durham University, would be suitable uh, to be uh, used for mine water heating. So to replace the, the gas heating with mine water heating. This is a project that started years ago, well before I uh, ever looked into this, between uh, John Glewis, Charlotte Adams, and the, the principal at the time of the, the college, uh, Dave Harper, who, who retired since then. Uh, but they, they wanted to look into this, and Michael actually continued on this uh, by looking at the technical, logistical, economical, and social aspects uh, altogether. Um, and um, 
uh, I'm, I'm glad that I'm able to show you some results of this of this project. So uh, Dan mailed it just to, to give you uh, to, to get a little bit of background for those of you who are not from the university. So as I said, it's one of the one of the colleges at Durham University. It consists of eight individual buildings. Uh, with a total floor space of about 31,000 square meter. It uses about 4 million kilowatt hours per year. And uh, during peak times in the winter, it, it uses up to a, a thousand kilowatts. So whatever system we would like to uh, put in place to, to provide the heating uh, needs to be able to deal with these, with these numbers. Um, that mill that is located here just to the south of the center of Durham. So uh, the, the, the yellow star is when, where Vermildet is, is located. Uh, so the first step was to take those old mine plans of the mine sitting underneath Durham University and to impose them in, in ArcGIS to, to, to digitize them. Um, the next step, uh, and we're going to zoom in on this, on this smaller area now, so the next step is to, to digitize those maps. Uh, so again, just to get your eye in on, on this particular map, here's the southern part of the of Durham Peninsula. Uh, uh, Van Mildred College is located again here with, with the star. Um, and um, we decided to look at two individual seams, so the, the, the so-called Hutton seam and the Busty coal seam. Uh, and those are two seams sitting uh, underneath basically the southern part of Durham, essentially underneath almost the entire Durham University. So the Hutton seam um, is about, it sits at about 61 meters depth, whereas the Busty seam is sitting deeper, it's more like 150 or so meters depth. The Hutton seam was, was mined first and the Busty seam was mined later. Uh, and significant amounts of, of, of uh, coal has been extracted from both of these seams. So, the digitization of the of these seams uh, are shown here. So in blue, we've got uh, the, the the roadways uh, of of the Hutton seam, and in red, we've got the roadways of the Busty seam. The Busty seam is not complete actually; it extends significantly further to the west, all the way to to uh, to Meadowfield and and um, the Little Burn Industrial Estate further to the southwest. But that's not really relevant for, for the, the mine water system we want to study here. So the idea is that um, the mine water system could work by injecting water into the Hutton seam, then let the water flow throughout the Hutton seam, and then get eventually into the lower Busty seam where we then extract the water from. So we need to look for connection points between the two seams. And the, the connection points are typically the, the, the shafts that are located, uh, or at least some of the shafts that are located uh, and were previously used to get the people down into the mines. And one of those shafts, one of the nearby shafts, is actually located where the green triangle is, which uh, on the mine plans seems to have been exactly where Collingwood College is, is located today. Um, so uh, Michael actually investigated this particular situation and how this could be used for, for mine water heating. So this is uh, showing you the same picture, but now showing the temperature fields that we expect to get in the mine system once we have uh, uh, water circulation up and running. So to give you some information, the, the, the rock temperature of the mines is about 13 and a half degrees. Um, and we decided to extract three and a half degrees uh, using heat pumps. And that means that the injected water is going to be uh, 10 degrees or so. Uh, the water is injected on the grounds of Mildred, and it's going to flow through the Hutton seam. Uh, uh, and you can see this in the temperature. So we've got fairly cold temperatures around the injection point. Ultimately, the water then enters the shaft uh, near Collingwood and then enters the, the Busty seam deeper down from where it then flows back towards Van Mildred, where you can extract it again. And um, uh, those, uh, this is the circulation that was, was investigated. Now, unfortunately, because this is a fairly short pathway, the temperatures really uh, were a bit too low at the outflow temperatures, only 12 degrees, where we'd expected it to go up to 13 and a half degrees. In addition, uh, there are other disadvantages for Van Mildred, which is that uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 
the buildings are actually uh, relatively old. So quite a lot of retrofitting is needed for these mostly 1960s built uh, uh, college. So Michael decided as a final part of his project to look into another possible uh, building that could be used for mine water heating. And that is the teaching and learning center that's a bit further north across the road from the physics department and very close to St. Mary's College. This is a much more modern building, so it doesn't need a lot of retrofitting. It's, it's fairly suitable as it is. Uh, and the other advantage is that the, the pathways are going to be much more favorable. So the water could be injected into the Hutton seam because the Hutton seam is actually located right underneath the teaching and learning center. The, the busty seam actually doesn't extend to the teaching and learning center, unfortunately, but gets very nearby to St. Mary's College, which is only a uh, hundred or so meters away from it. So the idea is to inject into the Hutton seam, the let the water flow all the way to this, to this shaft, which is actually quite a long pathway. And from that back to St. Mary's where we would pump it up and, and, and uh, transport it back to the teaching and learning center to use it for heating. And it turns out that that is actually much more profitable. The temperatures at the outflow point uh, were consistently high enough. So the, the mine system would be working long term. And uh, it looks like this is a situation that is really worth looking further into for potential possibilities of mine water heating. So that actually brings me then to the end of my talk. Um, so to conclude, I hope I convince you that mine water heating uh, is, is something that should be looked into further because we've got huge resources available. I described a little bit the GEMS project that uh, is going to uh, happen at Durham University and, and the British Geological Survey for the next three years and is funding four PDRAs. Um, the, I think mine water heating is looked like it's, it's going to be uh, economically viable soon if it isn't already. Um, I described the mine uh, water modeling tool, which we might be able to use to look at uh, feasibility studies before we do expensive drilling. And as a, as a case study, we looked into uh, Van Mildred College, uh, which seems like not an ideal location and requires a lot of retrofitting, but perhaps the teaching and learning center is a more suitable target for future mine water heating. And uh, with that, I'll stop here and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeroen, thank you very much indeed. At least you can hear my, my clapping. Um, uh, an excellent talk. We have one question at least in the chat. Uh, Colin, uh, would you like to ask your question? Thank you, John. Yes, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed because I started my question by thanking Jerome, Jerome for a really interesting talk. Um, and the two, the two things I put in as questions, he's almost totally answered already. I, sh I should perhaps declare an interest. I'm, uh, I'm sitting about two miles south of the Kalman or the university. Um, only a few hundred metres from the entrance to the Shincliffe Colliery, mm. which operated in the 1870s, I think. So I'm certainly one of the one in four homes sitting on top of a, of a former mine. Um, the questions that I put in, which I guess everybody who's, will have seen, um, and they're, if you like, the layman questions, is there a minimum mine depth for this sort of a system to be viable? Mm. So, um, do you want to do that one? Then I'll give you the second one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so the 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 minimum. I'm not sure if there is an actual minimum mine depth, but but the, the colder the water that's been used to warm, uh, to 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 feed the the heat pump, the less efficient the feed, the heat pump is going to be. Uh, sure. But um, even when you would take uh, uh, very shallow. In fact, the, the example I just gave is actually an example where the water temperatures are still fairly low and it yeah. still works um, because uh, temperatures of around 13 or so degrees are still high enough to extract enough heat out of the system. But yes, warmer mine systems would work better, would be more efficient in, in extracting heat. So, uh, and that means deeper mines. So deeper mines would be warmer mines and would be more efficient. But I don't think there is an absolute minimum it's just the shallower the mine, 
the colder the mine and therefore the less efficient the system is going to be. Yes, I, I understand that. And of course, there's the, the, there's the cost question, isn't there? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So your, your second part of uh, your second question, Colin? It's kind of linked with, you know, when when the the circulating water has has had its heat extracted, mm. so it's back down to, shall we say, 10 degrees or something, and it gets re-injected. Uh, this is a terribly sweeping question. But, um, yes. How long does it take down there to revert back to whatever was its original temperature? Yeah, so, the, well, it, it, it depends on a lot of... This is not really satisfactory. This is a big question. Answer, but <laughs> it depends on a lot of I things. I know. But, but, but essentially, if, if you would take the system that we, I was just describing, uh, to give you an idea, the water flows through the mines with a speed of a few centimeters per second. So it's a very, very slow flow. So it takes quite a long time to flow from one end to the other. If it would flow through, for example, uh, rubble or a porous media flow, the, 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 the warming up would, would, be, uh, would be happening uh, much faster. Uh, because there is more interaction between the, the rocks and the water. So if you have a very large pipe system, a very large mine system, then the warming up is probably very, very slow. Whereas if, if the pipe systems are very small, there's much more interaction of the, the cold water with the warm rocks, and therefore it would warm up faster. Okay, sure. uh, thanks, uh, Irene. Mac, um, I was going to say this, uh, uh, this technology is spreading beyond the northeast. Uh, and uh, Maxim Bassett-Law. So, uh, Mac? Thank you very much for the present. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting. A um, couple of questions. Uh, one, which I think someone else is actually potentially going to ask later, is um, you've, you've cited a 100-year life expectancy for utilising these heat sources. Um, why so short uh, and not something longer. The other one is more related to sizing of these sort of uh, heat systems. What we've just looked at in your last example is what's required for a single building. I realize you could probably uh, pull and, and um, re-inject water in different locations to be able to utilize that sort of heat source for multiple buildings. But if you were to look at a housing estate pulling many hundreds, if not thousands of kilowatts for, for a heating system, how large and how deep of a mine do you actually need to be looking for? Yeah, so, so um, uh, sorry, the, the first part of your question was about? Longevity. Oh, yeah, the, the longevity. longevity. Lifespan. Yeah, so so um, um, the, the, the 100 years is actually, uh, th that was just to quote, uh, that would be the, 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 the amount of heat that sits in the water right now. That's not even considering reheating the water. That's just the heat of the water that's at in the mines right now. So in fact, you're right. I think what we what we would aim for is a system that would work indefinitely. Um, so, and that would be achieved by making sure that the heat we extract from the system is going to be replenished by the time it, it flows through the mine. So if you, if you, wouldn't, if you would extract the heat too fast, uh, then it doesn't have time to to reheat, and therefore it's going to you're going to slowly deplete your system, which is what you would like to avoid, and that probably leads into your your second question, uh, is how large does a system need to be? Well, if you make it too short, too small, then you you take more heat out of it than than it can provide, uh, whereas if the system is large enough, uh, then then basically uh, you can continue to provide. Uh, heat over a much longer period. Now, I guess you would like to see some some numbers. Um, so, to give you an idea, the, the, the mine system I was just showing, uh, which is uh, what we're talking about, a few by a few kilometers, that seems to be uh, sufficient to provide uh, heating for uh, a building with a total floor space of around I don't know fifty thousand square meters or something like that. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to draw it to a close because I'm going to get checked out of this, uh, oh, this room in okay. a minute, yeah. uh, if I may. I, I'd like to thank you again, if I uh, may, Jeroen. And, and for those on the call, just to advertise, Chris McDonald uh, will be speaking next week. Chris is the chair of the Board of Trustees at Red Hills and the Durham Miners Association formed in 1869. And by 1915, the union was sufficiently wealthy that it opened its newly built headquarters. Uh, at Red Hill in Durham, and has outgrown uh, its previous HQ on North Road. 
Red Hills has just received a four and a half million pound funding from National Lottery for its restoration. And we'll hear something of the, the work of the uh, a charity at Red Hills and what it's doing in terms of uh, uh, community engagement. So uh, my thanks to Yeroen once again. Um, this is a technology which we will see rolled out. This morning I was in uh, South Shields talking to uh, technical college uh, students about the potential for uh, uh, working in this uh, new and renewable area uh, in the, the years to come. So Yeroen, thanks very much indeed. See you all next week, or two weeks from now.